Hello, TMFA. How's it going out there? Happy Technique Tuesday, everybody. Dialect Coach Chris Lang here coming at you. Um, wanted to hop on the group today and uh, see if we could do a Q&A of sorts uh, on accents. Um, there's a few things I want to talk about, of course, accent-wise, that I feel like most everybody ought to know. Uh, but I also uh, know that you guys have specific questions about accents, accent training, uh, your you know career in general uh, through the lens of accents. And I would love to be able to uh, help you guys kind of manage that information as well. Um, I'm going to keep my eye on uh, the page over here for... Um, uh, for comments and questions, of course. Um, uh, so if you have, have any questions, you have any comments, you have anything you'd like to know about accents, accent training, you and accents, your life and accents, language, uh, you know, as relates to film, television, theater, any of those things, put your questions into the comments and I will be sure to give them a look. Uh, so anything that you have, uh, you know, that's tickling your brain today about accents, um, want to make sure you get those questions asked. Um, but the thing I want to talk about more than anything today um, is actually something that most actors um, have had some, I don't know, a little bit of, of interaction with at some point, but then uh, mostly kind of, you know, it goes by the wayside a little bit. Uh, and that, for me, is the issue of vocal anatomy. Big scary words. Sounds like school. Sounds like an anatomy class, a science thing. Um, I guess at some level it, it is. It could be described like that. But really what we're talking about in terms of vocal anatomy is a shorthand way of describing the pieces of your vocal tract with your accent coach. So if you and your accent coach have the ability to speak fluently, effectively, and efficiently regarding any of the vocal anatomy stuff that you possess, suddenly it's a lot easier to make changes to your vocal anatomy in accents. Um, unless and until we have some level of awareness over our vocal anatomy, of our vocal anatomy, I should say, some level of awareness of the pieces and parts of it, how it moves, how it's put together, and how we use it on a day-to-day -day basis in our preferred accent. If we don't have any awareness of those things, we actually have no hope of being able to go from one thing to another accent. Because we will just kind of be at the mercy of our own native accent, no matter what. We're going to be at the mercy of that accent. Um, not that it's a bad thing to be at the mercy of your accent, but if you're looking to expand your repertoire with more accents, yeah, then it's not the best thing necessarily to do your physical stuff in your vocal anatomy like your native preferred accent does. So vocal anatomy is a huge, huge, huge part of this. And... You know, in the same way, like if you've ever played sports, I'm a big sports guy. And if I tried to take somebody on to, for instance, uh, the rugby pitch and I tried to, you never played rugby before. You had no idea what we were doing. And I tried to quickly explain the game to you without like really trying to tell you who these people were over here and there. That's that position. That's what they do. That's that position. That's what they do. These three guys all do this thing together. This is a rock. This is a scrum. This is a line out. These are all the jobs in there. Unless you knew that, you'd have no hope of being able to actually try to even play rugby. Same thing with accents. Unless you know what, like who the team players are, how they line up, and how they play together, you're really going to be um, kind of at a loss for being able to describe your accent, describe how you would like to change your accent to a new accent for whatever role it was or your career. Um, you'd be at a loss on how to actually describe those things. And so vocal anatomy is a big portion of accent training. It's how we, we make sure all these things get, um, you know, get kind of put into, into play and in an efficient way. You know, ultimately, it is really important for you to have the ability to uh, have a shorthand with your coach because there's going to be times where you don't have a lot of lot of time to prepare, and uh, you'll want to know 
you know, a, a faster, easier, bigger, better, faster, stronger way to get your work done on a deadline if you have to do that. Um, so let's dive into some vocal anatomy. Um, the, the first thing I'll say is this, all right? When it comes to accents, we, we can become fixated on what we sound like. All right, easy to understand why. It's an accent, it sounds immediately different to us. Sounds different, all right? However, think of it this way, the sounds are actually the result of something else. These sounds are what I like to describe as a tertiary concern at best, all right? The first thing is where are these sounds coming from? What is creating these sounds? And that, my friends, is the physical stuff. So sounds are a secondary, even tertiary concern, whereas the physical underpinning of these sounds is a primary concern. Um, it's such a big concern, in fact, that I'm actually going to deviate from what I was going to talk about and say this instead. Oh, Sandra has popped on. Hi, Sandra. I uh, love accent work. Thanks for this. I love accent work, too. <laughs> I geek out hardcore on this stuff. This is my bread and butter. Um, so welcome, Sandra. Feel free to pop any questions you have into the comments. Uh, so I'm going to deviate just a little bit and talk about this thing first. Why I'm going to place so much focus on what we feel and the vocal anatomy stuff. Why is that so important? <clears throat> your vocal folds right here, these guys in your, in, your, in your larynx here, in your throat, these are the, the things that actually produce sound. And I have a picture of this. I can even show you this. It's a great, great drawing here. Take a look at that. All right, so if we look at what this is here, this is a very rough approximation of what it would look like if I cut off your head and looked down your throat into your larynx. You'd see a piece of cartilage right here. This is the thyroid cartilage. You'd see a couple of arms kind of go up along the sides here with some knobs at the top. Then you'd see these two things that look like rubber bands, okay? So these two rubber band looking things, those are your vocal folds. Those are the vocal folds themselves. They're actually ligaments, and they're sort of in this apparatus. These are the two arms, the knobs. They're attached here and here, and they tighten and they loosen all the time. And think of it a little bit like a balloon that you've blown up, and you take that balloon and go, you pull the mouth wide, it goes, ee, 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 ee. Your vocal folds work on that same principle. They actually produce sound waves. This is cool, guys. Actual, physical, tangible sound waves. Sound waves are measurable. They're physical. They're something that we can touch each other with. When I talk to you, or when you actors talk to a scene partner, you're not just passing invisible thoughts towards them. You're literally physically touching them with your sound waves. Speech is as physical, and our voice is as physical a pursuit of anything we're after as actors as walking over and touching the scene partner and saying, move here, grabbing them and moving them. Your voice has this awesome capacity and ability just through its very nature to be physical, because it is physical. So these sound waves that get sort of sent out from your vo vocal folds, they actually bounce around your body. So if you put your hand here, everyone do this with me for a second, and just go... Hmm. Hmm. You feel something there, don't you? You feel probably, you know, we could describe it as buzzing or vibration or something along those uh, you know, lines. I usually call it vibration. But you feel vibration here. What you're feeling, ladies and gentlemen, is the sound waves that your vocal folds produce bouncing off of the bones primarily in your body and the water as well. So they, the sound waves literally vibrate your bones like a tuning fork. Really cool stuff. So, let's imagine this. If I took your vocal folds out of your body and blew air through them, they'd make a tiny bit of noise, a little bit of noise, but not a lot. It's like if I had a cello here and I took the, you know, the bow uh, and the strings and I took the strings off the cello and I rubbed the bow over those strings, they'd make a tiny bit of noise, just a little bit. But if I put those strings back on the cello, now there's big noise, big sound on that cello. Why is this? Because now we have the body of the cello. The body of the cello. And that's that space that those sound waves get to go in, and they get to bounce around the inside of it. They resonate. They amplify themselves. They grow and change. 
your body works exactly like that for the sound waves your vocal folds produce. So your vocal folds produce sound waves that then bounce around the inside of your body. So this is important because I'm going to go ahead and guess that you've had something like the following experience that I'll describe here. Have you ever recorded your voice like a voicemail message or you've recorded, you know, maybe even a self tape and you've played it back and you've listened to it and you go, Ugh, that's my voice. That's what I sound like. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever done that? A lot of people have that experience. Why is it that we don't recognize the voice that we hear as our voice? When we hear our voice every day, what's going on there? Why don't I recognize this? Why don't I, what, what, why? What's happening? Well, here's the deal, you guys. <laughs> you don't actually know what your voice sounds like. <laughs> you know what your voice sounds like inside your head. The sound waves that your vocal folds produce, they're bouncing around the inside of your head where your ears are. We hear your voice after it has left your body and sort of tra traveled through time and space, those sound waves, bounced off of the surfaces, you know, entered our ears. So what this means, you guys, is that you don't actually know what your voice sounds like. And because the voice inside your head is so variable on a minute to minute basis, like it'll sound different to you if you just got up versus at the end of your day, if you're hungry versus if you've just eaten, if you're well hydrated versus dehydrated, if you have allergies, if you're sick, if you're in an echoey room, a soundproof room, outside, in the car, in the bathroom. Every single second of every single day, the experience of what you hear inside your head is different. So because it's so varied and variable, we can't trust it. We cannot trust what our voice sounds like to us, especially because the voice that everybody else hears is so different. Like we don't even recognize that voice when it's played back to us most of the time. So if we can't trust what our voice sounds like to us, what can we trust? What our voice feels like to us. That, my friends, we can trust. Every single minute of every single day, you can trust what your voice feels like because it's tangible. When we did this, you felt that vibration. That is a sensation that is literally feelable, tangibly. All right. It's not made up because it's, you're measuring something that is happening in the real world is you're, you're being able to measure through touch the vibrations that you feel here. And that's really important for us. It's because it's knowable. Suddenly now all this voice and accent stuff that's a little bit of a mystery sometimes is now knowable. I can know it. Number two, I can recreate it. <laughs> this is the important part. I can recreate this stuff. If I know what that sensation is, I can actually go back to my physical experience and recreate that sensation. That's huge. So it's knowable. It's recreatable and it is therefore reliable, always, always reliable. So when I get fixated in my training with my actors and my students and clients uh, on the physical side of stuff, this is why is because in the moment as an actor, you don't actually know what your voice sounds like, but you do know what it feels like that everything for you. That is the key to your success. Changing your paradigm as an actor who wants to become an accent actor into this idea of what does it feel like when I speak? So vocal anatomy wise, what does it feel like? What does my jaw feel like? What do my lips feel like? My tongue, my teeth, my soft palate, my uvula, my larynx, my pharynx. What do all these things actually feel like? And once you have an idea of where they are, all these pieces of your body, how they move and can move, and what we can do with them, then we start to build a, sort of a catalog or a library of physical sensation that we're used to or not used to. And that is how we build the accents. We build the accents out of that physical experience. You, you can't you know, rely on sound, like I said, right? And if you can't rely on sound, that also means you can't rely on what you think you sound like to yourself doing the accent. So you have to rely on what it feels like to do the accent. The sounds are the result of these physical things that we're doing. So 
we have to chase the sensations to ensure that we are chasing the right kinds of sounds, ultimately, that these sensations will create. And you can do that as an actor. You can't listen to yourself as an actor, right? You can't watch yourself act, can you? Anybody try that? What happens when you try to watch yourself act? Well, now all of a sudden you're not acting. You're not in the moment. You're standing there judging your performance. A um, good friend of mine is fond of saying, you can't be both in front of and behind the camera at the same time. And that's true. So every actor, like, there's no way to do that. You have to be in the moment. So as an accent actor, you also need to have the ability to be in the moment with your accent. So that means you can't listen to yourself. <laughs> or at least you can't listen to yourself exclusively. Ultimately, because we are hearing and seeing individuals, we hear things. So it's not like we can go deaf to the sounds of an accent we're making. But we have to be able to pair what we are hearing with what we are feeling. So we have to hear slash feel all the time when we're in accent. And primarily feeling. I'd say it's 95% feeling, 5% hearing experience. I would say that's probably the direction we want to push ourselves into. Um, so... Um, <laughs> That, that was the rabbit hole I decided to jump down uh, as soon as I got started talking about vocal anatomy because it's, it's so important why we have to feel these things instead of hear them. It, it's so crucial to this work. Even if you're a good mimic, you know, um, how many of you out there are good mimics? You may say, like, yeah, I can hear a thing and I can usually mimic it. Great. Okay, and that's actually a really valuable tool for you as an actor. It means you bring some of that skill into accent work already. But if you can mimic really well, but you don't know how it is that you're doing it, that's actually an issue. That's a problem, or a challenge at least, because we don't have the ability at that point to be as specific and detailed and, again, reliably recreatable as we want to be. We're always going to be sort of trying to remember kind of sort of what we thought it sounded like and to try to do that. If, on the other hand, we have an underpinning of physical structure that we know what it felt like and what it sounded like at the same time when I mimicked that thing, then I know not only do I hear what I think I hear from another person, which you can trust that, just not from yourself. So I can hear that thing from that other person, but it's got a reliable foundation that's based in physical sensation under it. So even if you're a good mimic, you, you desperately need this kinesthetic awareness to fully realize your potential as an accent actor. Really, really crucial. Um, so let's talk a little bit about vocal anatomy. Um, you saw my picture of the vocal folds earlier. Okay. Uh, here's another picture. If I cut your face in half and turned you to the side, here's what we would see. Something like this. Okay, we'd see some pieces of your vocal anatomy kind of set up like this. Let me just point out some of these things to you. All right, first things first, we've got the lips, the teeth, and the tongue. The tongue is actually huge, you guys. It's giant. Giant. Tongue is very big. But we only ever feel this part of it. It's got a whole bunch of stuff under here. In fact, if you put your fingers right here and stick your tongue out at me a couple times, you will actually feel the tongue root. Right under here. That's where the base of your tongue is. So your tongue's a pretty big muscle. But this is, you know, I guess this is a pretty, it's a crude de depiction of it, but a pretty good one nonetheless. Up here at the top, you've got this little bumpy gum ridge. If you take your tongue, just behind your upper teeth, feel those bumps, that is called the alveolar ridge. We do a lot of articulation there in a lot of different languages, not just English, Spanish, all sorts of languages use it, to be perfectly frank. Big part of our speech. All right, then we've got this kind of roof of the mouth here. And you can feel that kind of hard roof of your mouth. That's the hard palate. Back from here, you've got the soft palate, or the velum, and then the uvula back here. The, the uvula, that's the little punching bag in the back of your throat. You know when you see a cartoon and they yawn? Uh -huh. And you can probably even see mine. Here, I'll show you my uvula here. Uh-huh. See that little dangly guy back there? That is my uvula. So, um... 
pretty cool part of my vocal anatomy. Actually, one of my favorite parts of my vocal anatomy because you can make it do cool things that I don't ever get to do in my own accent. <laughs> like I can make it trill, those kinds of things. I just like the uvula quite a bit. But all of these pieces of the anatomy, all right, interact and we have habituated them over the course of our lives to just behave certain ways. They behave certain ways because that's how we've always used them in our preferred accent. Our goal in accent training is to sort of break that down so that we, um, we're we not necessarily bound <clears throat> by the habits of our own vocal anatomy and our own preferred accent. We need to be able to bust out of those things and do all sorts of other things uh, as well. Um, let's talk about the tongue a little bit more. All right. Now, the tongue has... Um, has a few parts to it that I just want to, I just want to point out to you. Um, and I'm actually, I can't share my screen on Facebook Live because Facebook Live took that ability away. But I'm gonna put a video in the comments here um, that is really illustrative um, in terms of a lot of a lot of stuff. It is a video of an MRI of somebody speaking English. All right, I've just put that in the uh, in the comments. And you can play this thing, and you can watch how the tongue moves and how all this stuff actually moves in real life. Uh, but let's talk about the tongue. <laughs> okay. The part that we usually think of as our tongue. All right, this is what it would look like from the top down. So first thing I'll point out is the tip of the tongue. Right here. You can even put your fingernail into it. And you can point at things. It's actually pretty agile. You can count your teeth with it. Yeah, pretty good to use that way, right? Then you have this chunk right here. This is the blade of the tongue. The blade of the tongue is here. It's about as much tongue as will cover the first knuckle of your finger. Right here. Okay? And the blade of the tongue and the tip of the tongue often are used interchangeably. I know in my accent, I use the tip and the blade a lot both uh, kind of for the same things. So you may feel that for yourself as well. Then we have the body of the tongue or the dorsum, D for dorsum. It's the cool Latin name for that. The dorsum, my friends, has a front, a middle, and a back, all right? And you can even feel these things. Let's start with the front of the dorsum. It says right here behind the blade. Huh? Uh -uh. And just scratch it with your fingernail. And now put it back inside your mouth. Feel where it lives. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, feel sort of where it lives in your mouth. What's it next to? What's it touching when you close your mouth? Kind of the alveolar ridge, hard palate area. So let's find the middle of the dorsum. Ha. Huh. And if you're like me, you have a champion gag reflex every time you touch your tongue. It's awesome. So that's the middle of the dorsum, right? Yeah. Now let that go inside your mouth. Mm. How many of you feel like that is the back of your tongue? A lot of people usually do, but it's actually the middle of the dorsum. Kind of swooping up there in the rear end of the hard palate when you close your mouth. Finally, back of the dorsum. All the way back there, uh-huh. And then you feel how far back that goes when you close your mouth. Back of the dorsum, pretty cool. Okay, so now we have these pieces of our tongue. How do they move? I'm going to give you sort of three, four main ways that this anatomy moves. I want you to try this out. All right, the first way this tongue can move is sort of sideways. So just as an experiment, can you, friends in TMFA, make your tongue into the shape of a pancake? Really wide. Stretch it wider than your teeth, even. So it can spread, totally, actively spread. So, release that. Let's see, how about this? Can you, just as an experiment, make your tongue into the shape of a hot dog? Now, not a hot dog bun the hot dog. Can you make your tongue into that shape? 
That's what I want to see. This exercise, by the way, when I put these together, is called pancake hot dog tongue, conveniently enough. It goes like this. You can try that. All right. For some of you, it may be hard. If your tongue and your preferred accent naturally does hot dog, you may find it easier to do hot dog. If your preferred accent has more pancake tongue in it, that may be easier for you than the other one. But play around with it. So those are the first two ways. The other ways are tongue moves that either arches or it cups. Okay. Let's find arching. Okay. Whistle, if you can, with me from as low a pitch as you have to as high a pitch as you have. Feel this and just see if you can sense what your tongue is doing as we whistle. Here, let's start low. Cool. All right. In that exercise, what you felt was probably your tongue doing something like this. Maybe you would feel it or describe it moving forwards and backwards. Maybe some of you felt it moving up or down. Really what's happening here is that your tongue is arching the dorsum. All right, when we're whistling low, it's the back of the dorsum. It's going... So as we get high, we actually move that arch all the way to the front of the dorsum of the tongue. So your tongue has this ability. In fact, if you said the word ew really slowly, like ew, if you said that really slowly, you actually will be able to feel the same thing. It goes from the front to the back of the dorsum. goes ew. And you could do it in reverse, too. That, my friends, is arching of the dorsum. So let's find cupping. Easiest way for me to find this is just to yawn. So everyone yawn. Oh, it feels good to yawn. Oh. Yeah, right? Now, you notice my tongue did this. It, like, pulled back. So that, my friends, is an amateur yawn. We in this group, we are professionals, so let's yawn professionally. That means keep the tip of your tongue. Yeah as we yawn, and we go this. And that is cupping the tongue. Your tongue does both of these things, arching and cupping, as you speak all the time. And it's not just wholly arched or wholly cupped. It's these different parts of the dorsum, the front, middle, or back of the dorsum, that arch and cup kind of in concert with one another. So, in fact, let's do this. Um, let's speak a short piece of text together. I just want to see if you can feel these parts of your tongue moving in these ways. Um, okay, I have, <laughs> I have a whole stack of these. <laughs> I'm just trying to find what piece of text ought I to make these people on TMFA talk. So this is a piece of text that's usually associated with R words. If we ever have to change the way we make our R sounds, we'll do this. But I just want you to see if you can feel your own vocal anatomy moving in this way. All right, so here's what we'll have. Just repeat after me. Round and round the great arena race the Roman charioteers. Reckless of life, Heedless of risk, striving to gain that rich and rare reward that men call fame. Okay, let's do this again really, really slowly. Just see if you can feel your tongue arching and cupping and pancaking and hot dogging. Round and round the great arena raced the Roman charioteers. Now, Let's go even slower than that and resist any urge to sound like this guy, okay? Just do this in your own native preferred accent. Don't worry about how this guy here sounds, okay? Just do this how you would sound in your own preferred accent. Round and round the great arena 
raced the Roman charioteers, reckless of life, heedless of risk, striving to gain that rich and rare reward that men call fame. What did you feel, guys? Pop it in the comments. Can you feel that arching and cupping? Even the pancake and hot dog stuff that's going on in your tongue? It's really cool if you have the uh, ability to feel that. Because um, that's the beginning of awareness of your vocal anatomy that you will then need to bring into the rest of this work when you work with your, vo with your uh, accent coach. Um, so, uh, as always, I I'm open to questions as we go along. Is anybody? I'm going to just pop in here and see what the, the questions. Okay. Uh, nothing new so far, but as always, please do pop them in here. Um, let me uh, let me also say this. Now is a good time if you've been watching this for a little bit. Um, I have starting this week on Thursday an accent skills workshop that has two spots left in it. Two spots left in it. This is a six week week long uh, skills workshop. Accent skills again being the skills you need for all accents. A lot of this vocal anatomy stuff, awareness of your preferred accent, and that kind of information. It'll be uh, done, the workshop, through the lens of an accent that you would like to learn. For a lot of people right now in that workshop, that's a general American accent, but it could be any accent that you want to learn. This is the stuff, frankly, that if you came to me one-on-one -on -one and we worked together one-on-one, -on -one, I would spend our first maybe five, six sessions teaching you this stuff so you could do better at this work in the long run than just you know teaching you about an accent. Because I can do that in you know, an hour or so, teach you about an accent, but to teach you to do the accents and to do them while acting, that's the longer process. So um, this accent skills workshop is starting on Thursday. I only have two spots left in it, um, and I'd love to offer them to TMFA people first. Um, if you're looking to up your career and increase your casting opportunities, accents is a great way to do that. The more kinds of characters you can play, the more kinds of casting open up to you. And because every single person on the face of this planet speaks in an accent, every single character you ever play will speak with an accent. And the more accents you have in your back pocket, the more casting opportunities you will have open up to you. So this is a great way to uh, invest in yourself and your career over the next you know, uh, six weeks, especially as uh, you know, the industry's turned off right now. And wouldn't it be nice to get back to stuff when casting resumes and the industry picks back up with some extra flexibility in your toolbox for casting. So um, I'm going to go ahead and put the information for that into the comments for you guys so you guys can have that. Um, but there's only two spots left. And uh, I will offer you guys a special, uh, we'll call it the social distance discount. If you use the coupon code social distance, all one word, all caps, at checkout, you get a discount on, on, uh, on the, the six-week course. It's normally $349 to take for the six weeks. But with that uh, coupon code, it'll be $275 for six weeks. So that's a really good opportunity for you guys uh, to invest in some training. Uh, the number of, of TMFA members who reach out to me constantly say, hey, what do I do about accents? How do I, how do I go forward? Where, where do I even start? This, this is where you start for sure. Accent skills. So I wanna be available for you guys uh, to support you. I'm passionate about helping actors. Love you guys. Uh, love what Wendy's doing here on this page. Um, it really is something special that this community is like this and is as tight knit as it is. And so uh, I'm passionate about making sure you guys get the support that you deserve to be really successful as pros in this business. You know, um, and we want working accent actors. You know, forget the idea of being famous. You stand as much chance of being a famous movie star as you do of playing first base for the Yankees. But you can be a working actor. And you can be a working actor with a long and glorious career that's steady, that, you know, adapts to the changes to the times. And frankly, accents are a big part of being able to be that flexible. So I'd love to offer you guys that, uh, that as well. The final thing that I will say outside of the... Um, the Accent Skills Workshop, again, starting in two days. So if you want it, sign up today. Um, 
The final thing I'll say is there's another Facebook group that I would love to invite all of you to. It's called Dialect Coaches Worldwide for Actors. I'll put it in the comments as well, but if you look up Dialect Coaches Worldwide for Actors and you ask to join, there'll be some questions, a couple questions you have to answer, but tell them I sent you from TMFA. Uh, but this is a, a great forum for like-minded accent actors to get together. We created this, uh, myself and my colleagues from Dialect Coaches Worldwide. There's, uh, you know, five of us. There's me, Jack Wallace, Eliza Simpson, Adam Michael Rose, Pamela Vanderway, and me. I'm the fifth. <laughs> I was like, who did I forget? Uh, this guy. <laughs> this guy with the glasses, I forgot him. Um, but uh, the five of us uh, decided to create a space that uh, actors can come to for accent support and lots of uh, good information, lots of Facebook Lives and stuff like that. So you can really, really get tied into your accent work and get the support you need um, you know, for the long term. So I wanna invite you all to join us at Dialect Coaches Worldwide for Actors uh, as we you know, try to support you guys the best we can. So that's it, unless there are any more questions, let me just check in real quick. Um, okay. Ooh, a couple good things here. Um, and yeah, so there's a couple people joining us uh, who are members of a couple of accent skills workshops. Um, <laughs> uh, Yauhan has, uh, has mentioned this muscle, the levator labii superiorsis. These muscles right here that run alongside your nose and down into your lip corners, they're the ones that lift this upper lip up like this. Okay. Yeah, this is called the levator labii superiorsis. Also, I, I, I describe all these muscle names as like Harry Potter spells because it's just easy to remember them. So we have levator labii superiorsis. <laughs> That's that guy, if you ever want to remember that. Um, thanks, yeah, man, I appreciate uh, you bringing that up. One of my favorite muscles to talk about. Um, Sandra asks, is this good for voiceover as well? 100%. For voiceover, what we're dealing with is how do I modulate my voice? Uh, depending on the type of voiceover you're doing, if it's character voices, that's exactly the same thing as accents. You're essentially, every character voice is a new accent with some added stuff to it that's specific to the character. We usually call that an idiolect. Some person's unique version of the accent they're doing. That's an idiolect, right? For example, like Bernie Sanders, from Brooklyn, but he speaks his Brooklyn accent in a very specific way, right? And so that's his idiolect, if you will. Um, so for voiceover, how to modulate your voice, how to modulate the resonance, the placement, all this stuff, it's all physical. So yeah, this is perfect for that. So accent work isn't just for, you know, I want to be British or I want to be from West Texas or from wherever today. It is for even the most subtle, tiny, tiny little modulation of your own preferred accent for voiceover and stuff like that for commercials or if it's corporate voiceover or again, character voices, anything like that. Yeah. Highly, highly recommended. Um, okay. So Jaron, hi Jaron, you, you, you said hot dogging the tongue. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, he says he thinks the tip of his tongue is touching the hard roof behind his teeth. So doing this, for instance, uh-huh. So a yeah, I can hot dog and do that. Uh, the trick is can I do it, number one, without touching anything else, and number two, without getting my lips involved like this. Can I just do this? Uh huh. That's the trick right there. That's the uh, that's the the hard part of the exercise. Um, Brad Lyon asked, "How do how do you get rich R's?" That's a good question. First of all, I would say, "What's a rich R?" Right. Um, depending on what accent you're coming from and what accent you're trying to go to and how you want to modulate that stuff, um, your perspective on what, for instance, a rich R might be is gonna be very different than, for instance, mine. Um, in the same way that people say, hey, well, that's like the long O sound. I have no idea, frankly, what a long O is. <laughs> And I don't think anybody else does either, but we, we, we have to, you know, come up with a shorthand for ourselves that accommodates the fact that spelling happened, 
And we have this spelling, and especially in English, what we use in spelling has no bearing at all on what we use for pronunciation. Spelling and pronunciation are very different. Two very, very different things. Um, and in pronunciation and in speech, things that are vowels, for instance, in spelling are consonants. Like in America, our R is actually a vowel, linguistically, because it's a shape. It's not an obstruction that we're making. We go er, just a shape. Right. So uh, in terms of rich R's, Brad, I wish I had a better answer for that than uh, what the heck is a, is a rich R? <laughs> um, you know, uh, but it'd be interesting to know from your perspective what that is, what you perceiving as richness in an R. You know, is it a, a sort of hardness of the R? Is it a, you know, is the sound something that is unique and, and interesting? You know, I'd be really curious to know, Brad, what that is. What's a what's a rich R? Um, because there are all sorts of things physically we can do to modulate how we make R's. I can go ra, ra, ara, ra, 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 la. And I just did seven different physical things to do seven different kind of R sounds. So all sorts of different ways we can do R. And, um, yeah, I'd be interested to know what that is, Brad. That's good. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. Ooh, Darcel Key, could you give us an example of your favorite dialect? Gosh, <laughs> it's a little bit like asking me who's my favorite child. Um, let's see here. If I had to like pinpoint one of my very favorite accents, it's probably one that's close to my heart because um, I have family connections there. So there's actually two of them. One of them is West Texas. My mother's side of the family is from West Texas, and so I grew up hearing my grandmother talk with that accent, and um, yeah, so I just, I've fallen in love with it, um, you know, and if I could just describe physically what's happening there while I do it, that might help you as well. My buccinators, these lip corners, are going to be spread. My jaw is getting protruded just a little bit. The back of my dorsum is going to get elevated and pancake. And if I do all those things, then all of a sudden I get a West Texas accent out of this. So all I'm doing is just altering the physical shape and speaking English through that shape. All right, that, that's how accents are created. So West Texas is one of my favorite ones. Um, on my dad's side of the family, his side of the family is from Yorkshire. So uh, the, that Northern England accent is one of my favorite accents to, to teach, to coach, and to actually speak in. So uh, it was lots of fun when uh, Game of Thrones was on and all the men in the North had this Northern accent. So that's, that's one of my favorites if I had to pick two of them. I mean, I love South African accents. I love Australian accents. I love you know, Central European, Slavic, uh, Asian accent. You know, I, I can't choose, guys. I really can't choose really have a hard time choosing but thank you for making me try i really appreciate that um let's see here um all right uh bc van duerk i apologize if i butcher your name by the way um uh can you give us a few examples of vocal exercises so yeah just to remind you um you know that pancake hot dog thing mm -hmm. that whistling exercise for arching that professional yawn for cupping we have to you know it's way more comprehensive frankly than this venue this format allows but you have to take all of this musculature here to the gym you have to work it out so it gets strong and flexible and you can do things with it um you know it's tempting in these in these facebook lives to try to give some tips and tricks but um, i'll quote my wonderful colleague pamela vanderway the founder of dialectcoaches.com who says this no professional's career was ever built on tips and tricks it's built on solid technique and foundation of technique so as much as i could give you tips and tricks you know without context it's it's not going to make any difference to you what we need is we need to know the context of everything for instance why you can't trust your voice but you can trust what you or what you hear in your voice but you can trust what your voice feels like those sorts of things um you know the big more conceptual paradigmatic things the paradigms the lenses through which we see the work those are really really important for us and this is a great venue for that but more specific stuff that wants to happen one-on-one -on -one or in an accent skills workshop which you can sign up for at my website by going to dialectcoachchrislang.com under booking workshops two spots left for thursday so if you want it uh jump on that right now um 
let's see here. I'm just gonna check the comments again. Again, you just heard me modulate my accent, everybody. That's exciting when that happens. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I see any other questions, but if you have put a question in and I don't see it, I want you to go ahead and, um, let's see here. Oh, no, you know some. there is a new question. Yeah, I just saw this now. Um, let's see, Lindsay Slay, are there any good books you recommend for learning dialects or is it more of getting a dialect coach? Lindsay, that is a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. Um, there are books that can teach you about accents. There are books, and I teach for one of these. This is a great book called Speaking with Skill by Dudley Knight, uh, half of the Knight Thompson Speechwork creation team. Um, and you can learn a lot about accents and about speech, but I will say this. you want, If you want to learn to do accents, that definitely is about finding a coach and working one-on-one -on -one with that coach at some point. Because you need to develop these skills in the same way you develop your acting technique with an acting coach. You need to develop these skills so they can asset to you as an actor. So while, yeah, you can learn about accents in places, learning to do accents is a very different, you know, thing. A whole other kettle of schmetzels. So um, really, really good question, Lindsay. I'm glad you asked that. Because uh, it's, it's um, you know, I get asked it a lot, frankly, that question. And it's really, really good to be able f for me to be able to give you an answer. Um... Adriana says, how frequent do you have to train to bring your voice down an octave? Interesting. Um, if you're talking about the sort of place that you speak on a daily basis, um, <laughs> I don't know why you would do that. Um, unless somebody has told you there is something wrong with your voice and that you need to change your voice, in which case I think that there's something wrong with that person who said that you needed to change something about you to accommodate them. There's nothing wrong with the way you speak or your accent or anything like that. There's no reason to try to change where your speaking voice is, especially because you come pre-built with the way this thing works. It's not like you can suddenly change your voice to have an extra octave down low. What you can do is you can work out the muscles of your vocal control, your breath support, and all of that to more efficiently use the thing you've got, and you definitely can expand your range doing that. But to add an octave down, uh, without long-term training uh, and even even then, it might not even be possible, but really long-term training is the way to go on that with a really good qualified voice coach or singing coach or, you know, I happen to be a dialect coach, but my background is in voice, you know, voice training. So, you know, those sorts of things I could do, but um, I, I'd really be curious to know why. why. Why is that a thing that you would want to do? Um, you know, what's, what's wrong with your voice? Nothing. Let's, let's hear the voice that ah, is just like built into you. That, that's the voice I want to play with. Um, Sandra adds, will you have other classes? Absolutely. Uh, head on over to, uh, to my website, dialectcoachchrislang.com, and you can see all the classes that I will have there. Dialect Coaches Worldwide for Actors on Facebook. Uh, me and my colleagues, we, we will definitely talk about our, our class offerings there as well. Um, but certainly stay in touch. Shoot me an email. Let me know what you're interested in. If I have enough interest from enough people, I can create a new class too. I'm happy to do that for excited actors. Um, let's see. And, and, and Andriana, I'm, I apologize for the names. I'm, for as much as I specialize in speech, I suck at names. <laughs> it's just the way that goes. Uh, so she says, I'm cast as a bad girl, so I'd like to bring it down slightly for more serious moments. Okay, certainly that's something that you can do. And again, I can't give you like a tip or trick that can make that happen. But we can expand your range so you can speak somewhere else in your current existing range for your acting. See what it opens up for you there. That's definitely something we can do. Um... So, you know, but I would also ask you to think about it this way. Is that choice that you're making with your voice to speak lower? Does low voice mean serious or does it mean bad girl or does it, does it actually mean those things? Or is that a cliche that we're bringing to? Am I bringing my own bias about what a low voice might mean to these things? Because sometimes it's useful for us to play the opposite, you know, and have a light, friendly shiny sparkly voice that's higher up as the bad person like sometimes that is is maybe even more effective to play that opposite a more stark contrast 
Mm -hmm. But if you want to, yeah, if you want to bring your voice down, this that's absolutely something we could work on. It's a longer conversation than a Facebook Live for sure. But yeah, absolutely. That's something we can do if we want to find a different part of your voice to do some acting in. See what opens up to you there. Because all of your acting is manifest physically and vocally. So every time we change a tactic as an actor, boom, pitch, rate, volume, those three things change. So, you know, what tactics are we now opening up to ourselves by having this change of pitch? Kind of an interesting idea. You're welcome, Andriana. Um, all right, what other questions do we have here? Dun, 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 dun. Questions on accents. Holy cow, guys, I've gone for 50 minutes. I, I just can't shut up once I get started. You know, I'm going to call it there then because it's been a long time. Uh, so, uh, like I said, if you guys have any other questions, please do pop them into the comments. I, I'm definitely going to circle back. Make sure to tag me in the questions so I see it right away. And uh, I'll circle back and I'll, I'll, I'll chat with you about whatever question you have. But in the meantime... Um, Go to my website, check out my workshops, dialectcoachchrislang.com. Uh, check out Dialect Coach Coaches Worldwide for Actors here on Facebook and uh, tell them I sent you when you sign up and that you came from TMFA. We want to know that. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure as always to interact with you guys. Such a wonderful, vibrant, awesome community of actors. Um, a giant shout out to Wendy again. Um, and like, couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of this community. Uh, lots of great artists, lots of very passionate teachers, all helping actors to succeed. Um, you should never, ever, ever under any circumstances feel weird about reaching out to me through my website. If you need any help, I am here to help. want to make sure you guys get the support that you deserve in your careers to be as successful as possible. All right, my friends, I'm going to call it an evening. Um, until next Technique Tuesday, it's been a real pleasure pleasure. Stay safe, stay hydrated, stay inside, and I will see you all on the interwebs. All right. Ciao, everybody.